Hi, uh, this is going to be our review session for exam 4, Chem 112. Now, primarily the questions would be from nuclear chemistry. So most of the questions would be on nuclear chemistry. In addition to that, you also need to know polymer, the general information about polymer chemistry, when you make polymer harder, and then liquid, liquid crystals, again, general definition and information about liquid crystals, conductor, semiconductor, superconductor, and doping that goes with semiconductor, N-type, P-type, and you need to know the energy gap between valence and conduction band, how it changes conductivity property. And when it comes to superconductor, you need to know what is Meissner effect. I'll be more specific as I go, go over some of the sample types of problems. Now let me begin with our practice problem number one. So that's the practice problem number one. I'm going to give you something like this. So thorium is 90 and 232. Let me remind you what these represent. This represents number of protons. So I have 90 protons. This is the mass number. Mass number is for different isotopes the top number is going to be different depending upon how many protons and I mean how many neutrons are there. Protons are, will have to be the same as long as you have the same element. So number of neutron is going to be different. So in this particular case, the mass is 232 and that decays into lead. Atomic number or number of protons is 82 and the mass is 208. So the question is, how many alpha or how many beta would come out of this so that thorium changes to lead 208? So that's the question. And let's see how we can answer this. First, we need to understand what makes alpha. Alpha has two protons, two neutrons, so mass is four. So each time an alpha particle comes out, number of proton is decreased by two, but the mass is decreased by four, because each time alpha goes out. Alpha is same as helium nucleus, is same as helium. What about beta? Beta is nothing but electron. We write down as minus one, zero. The top number is the mass. Electron has a small mass, very small mass, so we pretty much ignored it here compared to mass of proton or neutron. So from now onwards, we'll be assuming that uh, mass of, it, of an electron is negligibly small compared to proton or neutron, and that's why we'll be writing down zero. So now, let's first find out the change in the mass of this compound. So as thorium change to lead, the mass is decreased. So decrease in mass, in isotope mass equals to, as a straightforward, 232 minus 208. That means as thorium change to lead, its mass is decreased, in this case you can, by 24. So the mass decreases by 24 units, now we know mass cannot be changed by electron or beta particle because it doesn't carry any mass, negligible mass. On the other hand, for each helium, mass would be decreased by four. Now we see decrease here by 24, so how many uh, alpha would be given off? So we can write down from here, the total, this is 24 times, so I'm going to write down four mass per alpha. So per alpha emission, let me explain this to you. Per emission of one alpha particle, mass is decreased by four, okay? Now here you have that many mass unit. So we're talking about six alpha. 
So when 6 alpha particle comes out, mass unit will be decreased by 24, and that accounts for this change. Now let's see what change is going to happen now if we consider thorium now 90 to 32. Now alpha, 4 alpha gets out of here. So minus, we can, we can write down like this. X 78 and then 208. Now what is happening here? You can always double check. Alpha 24. If you count the bottom numbers, I think this is, there are four of them. I'm sorry, there's six of them. There's six of them, so you can double check this. Six times two, 12. So if you add 12 to this, you get 90. And this would be six times four, 24. If you add this, it gives you 232. So we are all right with this. So I'm just double checking that how six alpha can account for uh, the thorium 90. But this is not what we want to get. We want to get this compound. Let 82 and top number is 208. Look at here, the mass is no longer changing. From going this x to lead, you can find out what x is by looking at periodic table and looking for element number 78. I'm not spending time on finding out that, but that's not what we need to look for. What we need to look for is how many beta particles will have to come out of this so that atomic number is increased from 78 to 82. So atomic number has to increase, let me write down here, atomic number has to increase by, our intent, intention is to get 82, so 82 minus 78, that's 4. So atomic number has to increase by 4. Now you think about how does beta particle change the atomic number. If you have a neutron and a beta particle comes out of it, so you can write down it's at beta minus 1, 0, R is same as electron minus 1, 0. That's beta particle. I want to know what happens to it as beta particle comes out of the nucleus. Balance the bottom numbers, minus 1, this has to be plus 1 to make it 0. This is 0, this is 1. So x has to be a proton, because that has 1 and 1. So that has to be a proton. So in other words, neutron is changed to a proton. So each time neutron changes to a proton, atomic number is increased. So now we need to increase atomic number by 4. That means four beta must be coming out. So our answer to this question is, for this conversion, we need six alpha and four beta emission. So a question like this would be on the test, so make sure you understand it and try not to memorize. Uh, so first, let me review this again. First find out the change in the mass from initial to final, and we found out that change was 20 by 24 units. Each time an alpha particle comes out, mass changes by 4 units. So how many alpha particle has to come out? 6. Now when 6 alpha particle comes out, each alpha particle carries 2 protons, 2 positive charge. So that's why 90 minus 12, that's why we got 78. So when 4 alpha particle comes out, 6 alpha, alpha particle comes out, atomic number is decreased by 12, and that's what you have here, 78. But in order to get lead, it has to increase to 82. So we found out that it has to increase by 4. And atomic number is increased when beta particle comes out. One beta particle, each time one beta particle comes out, atomic number is increased by 1. From here you can see that, because the neutron in the nucleus is changed to a proton. So having more proton means increased atomic number. So now we need to increase atomic number by 4. 
that means four beta particle has to come out. So that's the answer to our question. Now let's do practice problem number two. In this problem, we're going to calculate binding energy and binding energy per nuclear particle or nucleon. So I'm going to show you exactly how this problem is done. And every problem is like this. So if you understand one, you should be able to do all of them. So that's why I want to show you this particular one. Now we're doing it for nitrogen. Nitrogen, this is a very common isotope of nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen with mass 14. From periodic table, you all know that nitrogen has seven protons. Because if you look at the periodic table, is the is atomic is the atom number seven, that's the top number of periodic table. So that means nitrogen has seven protons plus seven neutrons. So what we need to find out here, binding energy. I'm writing down abbreviation, B for binding energy, and binding energy per Nucleon. Nucleon means nuclear particle. By nuclear particle means protons plus neutrons. So in this case, seven protons plus seven neutrons, number of nucleon is 14. So both protons and neutrons are added together to get number of nucleons. So now let's do this problem, but for this problem we also need a couple of values. We need the mass of proton, We need mass of neutron, and we need mass of nitrogen 14. So that these values need to be given. So let me uh, write down these values. For proton is 1.00728, 0.00728 atomic mass unit. For neutron, 1.00. 866 and mass of nitrogen is 13.999 13 .999, okay with these given values we want to know binding energy now what is binding energy when you have all these isolated protons and neutrons, these are all isolated protons and neutrons. If you, if you combine them together in a nucleus, like here, this is the nucleus, and I'm putting seven protons here. Three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And in between we have neutrons, neutrons. So I have seven protons and seven neutrons. Normally they would not be sitting together because protons repel each other. So after, after you put them together, a part of the mass will disappear. And according to Einstein, that mass changes to energy. So in other words, basically energy would be given off and that would bring these particles together. You think it this way, if you have gas molecules at a very high temperature, they would all try to fly away from each other. But if you cool down, cool down to its uh, freezing point, they're all going to get together and finally get liquid. Having liquid means they're now bonded to each other more strongly. Same is the case with nuclear particles. When they're all separated, they're more massive. When they bring them together in a small nucleus, then a part of the mass disappears as energy. It's pretty much like loss of energy. And loss of energy makes it more stable, and that's how they stick together. So let's now do this problem. First, we need to get the mass of seven protons plus seven neutrons. So mass of seven protons plus seven neutrons. I'm just going to write down. So seven times this mass, and seven times this mass. So I'm going to just show you seven times 1.00728 plus seven times 1.00866. 
depending upon how many significant figures you keep, your answer could be slightly different. But my uh, answer would not be that close. My given answers would not be that close. So you should not be uh, missing the right, uh, right one, right answer among the choices of answers. <clears throat> so this would give me 14.11158 AMU. AMU is atomic mass unit. Now look at here, this is the, when I have seven protons and seven neutrons, I put them together in the nucleus. Keep in mind, this is the nucleus. We're trying to make nitrogen. Look at, compare it with this mass. 13.9928, this is when they're together. That's a smaller mass than individual masses added together. And that's quite right, because individual masses, they are too much energetic. They would not be sticking together. So, what is the mass defect? I just few minutes ago mentioned a part of that mass would disappear as, a, as energy, and that would bring, them, bring these nuclear particles together. Just like loss of heat from gas sample would bring those gas molecules together, and finally they would condense to a liquid. So you can think about that analogy. So now in this particular case, we call it mass defect. Mass defect is the same as the amount of mass that disappears. Normally you would think that they would have the same mass, but truly not. A part of the mass disappears and changes to energy. So it would be 14.11158 minus 13.999234. So the mass defect, I'm trying to carry at least this many significant figures, 0 0.112346. AMU. After you understand this problem, make sure you select other problems of similar kind from the book for your practice. Now we're going to then apply Einstein's famous equation which is e equals to mc squared. It tells you if m is the amount of mass that changes to energy, you're going to get this amount of energy which is given by mass times velocity of the light squared. And we're going to apply that. First we must have the right units before we even apply mc squared. Now, so this is what we're going to do now, delta mc squared, so that I get energy in joule. Our energy unit is joule or kilojoule, but in this case we're going to get joule. So what I'm going to do next is take care of the units, three, four, six. Don't round off your numbers to one, two, or three digits because then it'd be a huge error. I need to change atomic mass unit to kilogram. Now why I need kilogram? Joule can also be written down in terms of mass unit. So it'd be kilogram meter square per second square. That's also joule. So that's what we're going to apply here. So we need to mass unit has to be in kilogram. So make sure you know the fact that atomic mass unit can be first changed to gram by an Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the power 23. Atomic mass unit would give you one gram. So it's the same as the Avogadro's number, except that that's atomic mass unit. Now, 1,000 gram makes a kilogram. So that gives me kilogram. And now I need to apply, multiply that by C squared. The velocity of light is 3.00 times 10 to the power 8 meter per second squared. So this whole thing is mass in kilogram, and this is C squared. So let's write down again so they're not to make a mistake. This is C squared. So basically we're applying Einstein's equ equation after getting everything in right unit. So this gives me, I'm just going to write down what I got, 1.68 times uh, 10 to the power minus 11 joule. Now that is the binding energy. Binding energy means how much energy is given off. Amount of energy given off 
tells you how strong is bonded. Because you need to provide that much energy so that nucleus can break down into all these separated protons and neutrons. So that's why it's a binding energy. So what we got is binding energy for nitrogen, 14. Now what is binding energy per nucle nucleon? So binding energy per nucleon would be given by binding energy divided by the nuclear particles, 1.68 times 10 to the negative 11, divided by the number of nuclear particles, which is for nitrogen is 14. So 14 nucleons, remember, 7 protons plus 7 neutrons make it 14. And answer that I got is 1.20 uh, times 10 to the negative 12. Ju per nucleon. So I hope you'd understand this. As I said, all problems are like this on binding energy and binding energy per nucleon. Now I'd like to move to practice problem number three. Okay, primary decay mode. I'll ask you a question like this. I'll give you a number of uh, nuclear, nuclear particles or isotopes. Uranium-92, 235, and carbon-11, oxygen 18 and giving you something like this we can ask you predict the mode of decay of these isotopes and what it does in, in you keep in mind this is these are all radioactive substances and we'll find out what kind of predominant what kind of decay you'd expect predominantly from these uh, substances Now let me talk, give you a background so that you can answer any question rather than memorizing uh, these problems. Now why, in my, in my lecture note also I mentioned this, so let me explain that about instability of nuclei. And then we'll come back to this problem. One, too many protons in the nucleus. If you have too many protons compared to belt of stability, belt of stability means scientists plotted all these protons and neutrons, and they find that that between one and twenty, belt of stability goes like this: equal number of protons and equal number of neutrons, so like this. Number of protons, number of neutrons, it's pretty much like this, from zero, 1 to 20. So I have the same number of protons and same number of neutrons, but beyond that, it goes diff differently. And this belt of stability, these are the stable nuclear isotopes, it goes up to 83. I think I, I should change my scale here. This is protons, number of protons. This is number of neutrons. Number of neutron proton, when it exceeds 83, all of them are unstable. Because the mass is too big. So in between 
1 and 20 isotopes which are stable, they have same number of protons as neutrons. So let me write down here, protons, number of protons equals to number of neutrons between, between 1 and 20. So I'm talking about this area. So keep that in mind, often we have that question. We'll be using it. So when we say too many protons, too many protons relative to this belt of stability, Two, too many neutrons. Too many neutrons. Again, I want to remind you this. Bottom number is the charge. Top number is the mass. Neutron, no charge, unit mass. And too big of a mass. The third is too large of a mass. Our common sense, based on your common sense, you'd be able to answer most of this. If nucleus is unstable because it has too many protons, so obviously the obvious answer would be it would try to nature would try to reduce the number of protons. So too many protons decrease the number of protons so that it can reach the belt of stability or it would reach a stable nuclear configuration. So how can change happen so that number of proton is decreased. In nuclear, there are only two particles. I'm talking about two major particles, protons and neutrons. So when you're saying that I want to decrease the number of protons, obviously I need to create or change it to neutron. So let's write down proton change to neutron. That's the only thing you can think of in a nucleus. Now let's find out what radiation has to come out of it so that a proton is decreased to neutron. Now balance it, balance the bottom number and balance the top number. This is zero, so this has to be one. Already I have one on the top, so it has to be zero on the top. So, so X is a particle that has unit charge but no mass. Now we need to think about whether you know any particle having unit charge and no mass. Electron is, like, electron is like that, but electron has minus one. So this is called positron. So you need to know these uh, particles. Let me write down this, some of these particles. E minus one, zero is electron. Electron or beta. E plus one, zero, or just one, zero, is Positron, positron, proton, we all know that one and one, and then alpha would be two and four. Two protons and two neutrons, that gives total mass four. So these are the nuclear, common nuclear particles. And there's another one, is gamma. Gamma is like any radiation, any kind of like your light, any kind of light that doesn't carry any charge or mass. So it's zero, zero. It doesn't change any charge or any mass of a compound or from, from a nucleus. Okay, now, too many protons, proton has to decrease. So what comes out, now we can identify this. This X, which is a particle that has to come out, has charge one, but no mass. So that is going to be positron. So let's write down here. So in this case, there will be positron emission. Too many protons, you expect positron emission. So whenever you find out that there's, you have too many protons in a nucleus, relative, relative to belt of stability, then you'd expect positron emission. What about too many neutrons? Again, neutron needs to change. Now, if I, want, if I have too many neutrons to begin with, I must decrease number of neutrons. That means number of neutron has to decrease. Again, there are only two things in the nucleus, neutrons or protons. So it has to change to proton. So that's how you should be thinking. And now you need to know what, what should come out of it. Let's balance it and find out. This is one, in order to get zero. In nuclear chemistry, in nuclear reactions, you 
add the bottom numbers and I add the top numbers. And that's how you balance the reaction. So it's pretty straightforward. So this is minus one and the top number has to be zero because one plus zero is zero. One minus one is zero. So that's, if, when nuclear, when, when neutron breaks down into proton or nu neutron changes to proton, you have a, another particle that comes out having charge minus one mass zero. And you can see that that's electron or beta particle. So we'll call it beta. Electron is the same as beta when it comes out of nucleus. So either you can write down E or beta. So this is too many neutrons, you'd expect beta emission. Now let's look at the third case, too large of a mass. Now what, lar what mass is too large? Number of proton more than 83, or atomic number, or number of proton exceeding 83. That means those nuclei have too many protons. So no matter how many neutrons you put in there, it's always unstable. So too large of a mass means mass exceeding for those isotopes with more than 83 protons. Our obvious answer would be if too large of a mass, reduce the mass. Now how can you reduce the mass most effectively? There are, these are the particles. Electron or beta particle, no mass, almost no mass. Positron, almost no mass. Proton has only one mass, unit mass. Alpha particle, four masses. So that's the most effective way one can reduce the large of a large mass. So in this case, you'd expect primarily alpha emission. Okay. Let's uh, have a review before we apply it to our problem. If I discover that I have too many protons in the nucleus, number of proton has to decrease. That means proton has to change to neutron and positron has to come out. So positron emission is expected. Too many neutrons, that means neutron has to decrease. In this case, decrease to proton and beta particle has to come out. So you'd expect beta emission. So in the too big of a mass, you want mass to decrease quite readily, and you'd expect alpha emission. So with this understanding, let's now apply to our problem, which I ask you here. In case of uranium, already I know that the number of proton is 92. It exceeded 83. So that means Uranium is unstable because it has a large mass. So what is the dominant emission from uranium-92? And we all know that uranium is highly radioactive. It's the alpha emission. Other particles also would come out, but it's the alpha emission is the major uh, particle that would come out and can change the mass of, of uranium. And eventually, it would become stable after it a number of breakdowns, it hits the belt of stability. So alpha emission is the primary mode of emission. So we answered this question. So here you don't need to do anything other than just by looking at number of protons or atomic number. Carbon, 6, 11. Now this is between 0 and 20. Between 0 and 20 atomic number, number of protons should have been same as number of neutron. So for most stable carbon, would be this, six proton plus six neutron is stable. It is stable means nothing would come out of it. But instability in this case is due to the fact we're looking at this compound, six eleven, the six protons. As long as you have carbon, you must have six protons. That remains unchanged, five neutrons. So this is on the belt of stability, the stable. Remember, belt of stability is based on the stable isotopes when plotted. So this is the belt of stability having six protons, six neutrons. But we have five neutrons. Looking alternatively, we have too many protons compared to neutron. 
So we call it too many protons relative to belt of stability. Five and five would have been stable too. And that would be 10. So too many protons in this case, and let's write down here, too many protons. Too few neutrons means too many protons. It's the same thing. So either you can call it too few neutrons or too many protons. Well, when too many protons, positron emission. I already mentioned about that. So what comes out of here? So we got the answer to this problem. Now let's try next one. Oxygen 818. Again, between 0 and 20, or 1 and 20, it should have been the same number of protons as neutrons. The most stable, stable oxygen has 8 protons, 8 neutrons. So it'd be 8 protons plus 8 neutrons. Same number. That's on belt of stability. But what do I have in here? 8 protons. As long as you have oxygen, you will have to have 8 protons plus 10 neutrons. Look at here. Instead of having 8 neutrons, I have 10 neutrons. So I have too many neutrons. Too many neutrons means I need to reduce the number of neutrons. That means neutron has to change to proton. And we already found out when neutron changes to proton, beta emission takes place. So it's a beta emission. OK, now let's review this and have an answer. The question is, what is the primary decay mode for uranium, carbon-11, and oxygen-18? For uranium, this is more than 83 atomic number or number of protons. It is unstable because too large of a mass, so alpha particle would predominantly come out. This has six protons <coughs> and five neutrons. It has too few neutrons or too many protons. So proton has to decrease, and this is how proton decreases with positron emission. Oxygen, eight protons, 10 neutrons. We have too many neutrons in case of oxygen, this particular oxygen, the number of neutrons has to decrease, and you'd expect this reaction where beta particle comes out. So answer to this question is alpha emission for first one, positron for the second, beta emission for the third one. Now we'll move to the next problem. This is practice problem four. number four. Now this is an interesting problem where you have a rock sample. We ask this kind of question, age of a rock sample. So there would be at least two questions. One would be on age of rock sample. Second one would be on age of an organic compound. It could be a statue which had carbon so carbon dating, or a living thing in present day, uh, after his death, how we know the age, how long ago he died, okay? So let's now go over a rock sample. In present day, the rock sample, let me write down these numbers, 75.0 milligram of uranium 238, 238, and 18.0 milligram of lead 206. I took this problem from the book. <clears throat> so in present day rock sample, 
you have 75 milligram of uranium-238, 18 milligram of 206, lead 206. So the question is, what is the age? Age of the rock sample. That means from the time of its formation. What time had to be uh, elapsed before you get this mixture? Now, the assumption is, at the beginning, all uranium. So this is the assumption. In all, every rock sample, you first assume that you had 100% of uranium-238 and it went through a number of alpha, beta, or these gamma emissions, finally end up with lead, 82206. So, at the very beginning, in time zero, if you consider it to be time zero, the rock sample had only uranium and nothing else. So as time went on, some uranium broke down and went through all these uh, alpha, beta emissions and finally ended up with lead. So this lead originally came from uranium. So keep that in mind. So let me now pictorially give you an idea of what's going on here. This is uranium-238 at the beginning. This is all uranium-238. Let's have a shaded line here. 100% 238. T equals to zero at the beginning of our time. Now we're spending T equals two years. How many years? We don't know yet. After how many years, that rock sample, which was 100% uranium-238, would be like this. Uh, we'd have... 75.0 milligram uranium 238 and 15 point, I'm sorry, 18.0, 18.0 milligram of lead 206. So initially I had 100% of these after many, many years we got 75 gram, milligram of uranium-238, 18 milligram of lead. Now we need to find out the number of years. What else is given? Half-life. You need to have the half-life given to do this problem. So let me write down this half-life. Half-life for uranium, all of the half-life refers to the radioactive substance, 4.5 times 10 to the power uh, 9 years. Okay, now let's do the problem. As I said, initially there was no lead. All lead came from uranium. Now look at this carefully. If I say, I will give you just a simple analogy here. In present day sample, let's make simple numbers. I have 10 uranium-238 in a present day sample and 5 lead-206. These are numbers, that's how we can think better. I analyze the sample, I identify that, find that I have five mole of, let's write down in terms of mole, five mole of lead, and say 10 mole of uranium-238. Since all lead came from uranium, and this is one and one ratio, one mole uranium gives one mole lead. This is one and one relationship. So, I have 5 mole of lead, 206. They obviously came from 5 mole in time zero. Let's go to back to time zero. 5 mole of lead came from 5 mole, uranium-238. And you already had 10 mole. 10 mole remain un unchanged, U-238. So if at time zero, how many moles of uranium you had? How do you do that? You just add up these two numbers. 10 plus 5, that's 15 mole, uranium-238, at time 0. So you calculate how many, how much time is involved. Okay, we're going to do the same thing. Find out number of moles for lead, and that came from moles of uranium, and then we're going to add them up to get the total moles, and then we can apply the expression to calculate so we're going to apply this expression, log of lead 
log of nt over n0 equals to minus kt. And minus k, k obtained by 0.693 over t half, half-life. And we already know the half-life. And we're going to plug in that number. Now well, let's now calculate n0. N0 is the number at time 0. Time 0 means the beginning. So we're going to add up these moles. So first calculate the moles. So I'm going to uh, do it. 75.0 milligram time 1000 milligram that gives a gram then this isotope has 238 238 gram one mole u238 so this is the this is coming from uranium-238. Remember, I, we added two masses together. And this part is coming from uranium-238 in present-day sample. So that's what you have. Now, the other mass that is becoming would be from lead. So we're going to add up that mass. 18.0 milligram times 1,000 milligram makes a gram. And the lead, this is coming from lead. This is from uranium. This is coming from lead. And lead has the mass, we already gave you that mass, of uh, 206. So milligram, milligram gives gram, and then 206, 206 gram gives a mole of lead. Here we are going to show you one extra step. One mole lead that gives one mole U238. So that changes to U238. So now we can add them together, both U238. If you do the math, this is what you end up with. Uh, total N0, by summing these two parts, we get 4.02 times 10 to the negative 4. NT, this is really NT. This is NT. This is the number of uranium. I'm sorry. This is the number of uranium in present day. This is also NT. N0 has some of these two. And this is NT. NT is the number of uranium in present day at a later time. And I calculated that number to be 3.15. So this is the total mass, total number. This is N0, not to get confused. And NT equals to 3.15 times 10 to the negative 4. Let me repeat this. N0 is the total number of moles. This is the mole remaining intact of uranium-238. That's also NT value. NT value means number of radioactive substance remaining intact after time T. And this is N0, the initial number, which would be given by the sum of these two. This is the amount coming from lead, and we changed it to uranium and then added them together. And so this is the total number in moles. From, this is, from moles to number, you multiply by Avogadro, but they cancel out. So I would keep it as moles. So let's now plug in our numbers and get our final answer. So it's going to be log of 3.15. You can double check my numbers by independently doing this calculation. 4.02 times 10 to the power minus 4 equals to t half. We already know the value of t half, which is uh, 4.55 times 10 to the power 9 years. So I can, give, I can give you my final values. This is going to be minus kT, which is 1.54 times 10 to the negative 10 T. And T is that time that we're looking for. So value for T, and then you do this math for log. This is base E, keep that in mind. You get one negative from that end. So I get 1.58 
times 10 to the power 9 years. So answer to this question is, after 1.58 times 10 to the power 9 years, 100% uranium would change into 75 milligram of uranium-238 and 18 milligram of lead-206. This is the end of our first segment of Review 4.